Great to see everyone here, and uh, I want to just say welcome to everyone really quick. My name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs Church, and it is an honor uh, to have each of you here, whether you're a regular attender here or if you're a first-time guest. It is, we're just thrilled that you're here, and we're praying that God will uh, open our hearts and let us hear what he's saying to the church today. Amen? Um, <clears throat> we're going to continue with a, a teaching series that I'm calling New Year. New you. And what I've been talking about is uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of us have ideas or misconceptions or fears that are related to the Holy Spirit, like maybe because of past experiences or things we've seen on TV or things that we've experienced that maybe we thought that it was kind of weird. We thought the Holy Spirit stuff is just like Star Wars weird stuff, and it just made, made uh, fanatics out of people or whatever. But I want you to, inv- and I just want to invite you in to understanding the Holy Spirit from a biblical perspective and how important the person and work of the Holy Spirit actually is in our lives, in our church, as we move into 2020 and beyond. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. Like I shared last week, if you, do, if you weren't here last week, we talked who is the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He's not an it, right? He is the third member of the Trinity. He's not just some cosmic or vague, impersonable, impersonable uh, force. But the Holy Spirit is a person, and He is God in motion, he is, he is God moving over the creation. The first time we see mention of the Spirit of God is in the book of Genesis. Right there when it all started, it said the Spirit of God was hovering or brooding over the earth. So the Spirit of God was even active right there at the beginning. But he's been, he's been moving throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament church, and he's still moving today in and through followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? <clears throat> he is God at work. One person said he is God up close. He is the, he is the near side of the Trinity. He is the promised gift of the Father. I want to show you this quote just as we get started by Pastor Francis Chan. It'll be up on the screen. It says this, The church becomes irrelevant when it becomes purely a human creation. We uh, We are not all we were made to be when everything in our lives and churches can be explained apart from the work and presence of the Spirit of God. In light of the days that we're living in, and I believe that we're living in the last days and the return of Jesus Christ is coming soon. In light of all that is going on in our world, and in light of the fact that the church of Jesus Christ has an immense mission to fulfill in these days, in light of the fact that this world is growing more and more skeptical, and this world is growing more and more resistant, and even greater in opposition, I'm convinced of this, guys. We need power, not just words. Words talk is cheap, right? You can talk all day long, but there, if, if there is no demonstration of power, those words can be left empty. It's like what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 when he said this. He said, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but what? but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. We need power, not just words. 
And as I look through the scripture and I find out, well, God, we're living in these days and how should we pattern ourselves? How should we pattern our lives? How should we pattern our church and the way that we operate? And we have to look at the book of Acts for the early church. How did they operate? How was, what were they doing? Because we should be doing like things. We need to pattern ourselves after the early church. In a reading of the book of Acts, we'll find, you will find that the early church was a spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-empowered, supernatural community. Look, at, look in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read this in, starting in verse 42. It says this, describing the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Like just listen to that. They devoted themselves. Like it wasn't a question. It wasn't a half-hearted thing. It wasn't just if I feel like it this certain day. Or if the church is singing my favorite song. I'll go. Or, you know, No. They were devoted. All in. They said no matter what. We are going to be devoted to what? Learning. They're devoted to learning, to growing as disciples of Christ, right? And what else are they devoted to? Fellowship. We said it earlier. Ashley said it. She's like, to be known is to be loved, right? Fellowship, knowing each other, spending time together, opening up to one another, and and being a part of each other's lives. He goes on to say, um, to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to what? Prayer and to prayer. How big is your prayer life? Well, I was talking to a friend this week and I said, Friends, if you will never succeed in ministry, you will never go very far in this Christian life if you don't learn to have a robust prayer life. If you don't know how to get alone with God in the prayer closet and seek His face and know His will and hear His voice... You're, you're going to struggle. You're going to limp through this Christian life. But, it, but look at the early church. They were devoted to prayer. And we need to be devoted as well. It says, it goes on to say this in verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe. And at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And you read through the book of Acts and you find that those signs and those wonders didn't even end with the apostles. There were other people who were functioning and operating in those signs and wonders. But what were they doing? Boy, what's a sign? It's something and a wonder. It's something that people go, wow, look what God did. And it provides a strong witness to Jesus Christ as Lord. This is a sign. This is a wonder. And how many of us have experienced signs and wonders? And I believe that as we move into further in the last days, we're going to see more and more of God's power being demonstrated through signs and wonders. And not of, and not of people who are uh, superstar Christians, right? These are, I believe that the move of God is going to begin to happen with everyday, ordinary people who function in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is going to begin to do more and more signs and wonders. And the people of our community, the people of this world, are going to be in awe of the goodness of of God. Somebody say amen to that. All right. Verse 44. It says this. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Man, this was generous. Give irrational, unexplainable generosity was happening in the early church. In the early church, they saw somebody had a need, and people raised their hand and and joyfully give. They would be like, "We're going to take up an offering," and the whole place would go crazy. Like, yes, we're going to be generous because we are going to be able to meet that need in Jesus' name. The early church was irrationally generous. Beautifully generous in meeting the needs of the people. 
Verse 46, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They were at church all the time. Look at what it says. Every, they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Listen, even in the early church, they were doing life groups. Come on. They, even there, they were meeting at church, and they were going from home to home, and they were fellowshipping. They were learning. They were praying together. And they were, oh, come on, somebody. They were eating together. Don't forget that. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the, fa the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number. It was the Lord, the Spirit of God, who was active and moving powerfully among them. And I just wonder how many of us are open and seeking the movement of the Spirit of God in our lives and in our church. Are we open to that? Our church will succeed based upon the degree on which we are open to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Will we open our hearts? Will we open our minds? Maybe sometimes God does things that uh, make us a little uncomfortable or make us a little uh, out of our comfort zone, right? But are we open? To saying, God, work in my life by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, fill me with your joy. Fill me with your power that I may serve you with effectiveness. And that I may serve you with the anointing of God upon my life. And they praise God. And they enjoyed favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is what we call a supernatural community. The early church, the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was moving in powerful ways all through their community. I want you to look at what A.W. Tozer said. This is one of the most challenging quotes I've ever read. And it says this, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, the early church that we just read about, 95% of what they did would stop. And everybody would know the difference. How dependent are we on the person and work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church? Do we go our own way and in our own strength and in our own know-how or do we depend upon prayer and the study of God's word and fellowship together and operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? You see, the church, we can try to do this Christian thing. Uh, we can try to do church in two different ways. You can try to live the Christian life in one of two different ways. Number one is this. You can live in your own human effort. You can strive. You can work harder. You can try to do more in your own in your own strategies and trying to figure it out, you can work, work, work and get burnt out really quick. It's like what the Apostle Paul said in the, uh, to the Galatians. He said, have you lost your senses? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? He said, you started your life in the Spirit. It's the Spirit who gives life. It's the Spirit who empowers us. It's the Spirit who indwells us and strengthens us and regenerates us when we become born again. It's the Spirit. You think you, you started your Christian life in the Spirit, but now you think you can perfect the things by working in your own human effort now? 
if you started in the Spirit and there's life in the Spirit, you should continue every day walking in step with the Spirit. The other way you can try to do this Christian walk is this, in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know God's way is always best? <laughs> we can do this our way. We can walk this out in our strength, in our power. Or we can do it under His power and under His influence. Well, I love what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 18. Boy, I love this. Don't get drunk on wine. Which, in, which leads to debauchery. Instead, what did he say? Be filled with the Spirit. Boy, be filled up with the Spirit. That's how we live the Christian life. We can live it like in a, in a rowboat, right? We're, we're working hard. We're working those oars. Man, this is hard. Or we can be like in a sailboat where we just put our sails up and we let the wind of the Holy Spirit give us the energy that we need to accomplish God's will. Do we do it ourselves? Or do we do it under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Don't be intoxicated with, controlled by, and live under the influence of alcohol, right? But instead, be intoxicated with, controlled by, and live under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. This is God's way. This is God's way. He never meant for you and the church corporately to function and flow under our own power. He wired us to be dependent. He wired us to have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us so that we can know His will and have the power to accomplish it. We were made for that. And when we function in a way that is outside of that, it brings stress. It brings confusion. It brings burnout when we're not living under the power of the Spirit. Amen? In verse 19, he goes on to say this in Ephesians 5. They began speaking to one another with, with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they submitted to one another out of their reverence for Christ. In other words, what I want you to see out of this as we look at the pattern of the early church is that when, when you live a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered life, number one, you're going to have a song in your heart. No matter what else is going on around you, no matter your circumstances, boy, the Holy Spirit fills you up and you're going to be singing God's praises all the day long. And we're going to be singing, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long, no matter what the devil tries to attack me with, no matter how discouraged I may feel, no, there is a song going to be in my heart, and I'm going to be singing praises and giving thanks to my God no matter what. Number two, man, you live that spirit-filled life, your life is going to encourage other people. Not only, you're, not only are you going to feel good yourself, but your life will be an encouragement to other people. He said, you speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Next thing is, man, you live that spirit-filled life, you're going to have an attitude of gratitude. You're going to be thankful. No, you're not going to be walking around criticizing and complaining and whining about everything. No, we're going to be thankful people. 
We're going to give thanks to God our Father for all the things that He is doing and has done in our lives. That's what it says, always giving thanks to God. And the next thing is this, you will have a heart of a servant. Boy, when you are living that spirit-filled life, your heart goes away from ego and about just you, and your heart begins to transform into a heart of a servant. So instead of you thinking, oh my goodness, what what am I going to get out of this? What's the benefit to me? No, God's going to change that through the power of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be asking, how can I serve? How can I make a difference? How can I be a part of serving and doing what God wants me to do? And sometimes it's sacrificial. Sometimes you think I I always feel like coming up here and preaching. Well, yeah, I enjoy it, but there are days when it is a battle. Where it is hard, where I have to say, Lord, you've called me to this. I'm committed to this. I'm going to show up and share your word no matter how I feel. But it's the same for all of us. Will we get involved? Will we serve with a servant's heart, even if it costs us something? Even if it costs us a little extra sleep? Even if it costs us having to show up and do things that we don't actually feel like doing that day? Do you have a servant's heart? It said, submit to one another out of reverence. For Christ. Well, I love how the uh, Amplified Version says this in verse 18. It says, Don't get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and be constantly guided by Him. Well, I love even how the message paraphrases verse 18 it says don't drink too much wine that cheapens your life drink the spirit of god drink in the spirit of god he says huge droughts of him i don't know what that word means but i'm just thinking huge gulps or huge portions of him right And the last thing I want to share with you is this. If you live that spirit-filled, spirit-controlled, spirit-influenced life, boy, you'll have the power to do God's will. You will have his power to do what he has called you to do. I love the verse in Acts chapter 1, then verse 8, where Jesus says this, But you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I want to share a story with you from a deeply theological uh, professional book that I read in seminary. It's called The Big Red Tractor. (laughs) The Big Red Tractor and the Little Village. How many of you know sometimes the most simple things make the most profound illustrations? Okay, this is a book that that we got our kids a while back, but I just want to read it to you. It's pretty, pretty short, but it says this. Once upon a time in a happy little village, a big red tractor lived in a cozy little shed. Each year when the snow started to melt, the villagers knew it was time to plow their field. So every morning, they'd go out to that little shed and wake up the big red tractor. They loved the powerful putt-putt-kaboom noises he made. And they cheered because the big red tractor helped them with their hardest job, plowing the field. Everyone worked together to move the big red tractor through the field Half the villagers pushed him, and the other half pulled him. He smiled cheerfully, glad to help them, even though they never seemed to move him very far. The villagers worked very hard 
And they always finished plowing the field just in time to plant delicious vegetables and sweet fruit before the rain came. The rain fell from the sky and watered the field. Then the sun came out and made the seeds grow. Finally, the villagers gathered all the food in large baskets, and everyone celebrated, everyone shared. There was just enough food to feed the whole village. Then, one cold day, something amazing happened. Farmer Dave was cleaning out the attic and discovered a book tucked inside an old chest. It explained how the big red tractor had been made. And it showed powerful things no one knew he could do. Farmer Dave stayed up all night reading the book. And he couldn't wait to tell everyone what he had discovered. The next morning, Farmer Dave gathered the villagers to tell them the good news. The big red tractor can move on his own. If we fix him, he could plow the entire field in just one day. But nobody believed him. There's no way that tractor can move on its own, they said. It sounds like a fairy tale. They laughed at him and went back to their work. And this made Farmer Dave very sad. But Farmer Dave didn't stop believing what he had read. Every night while the villagers were asleep, Farmer Dave stayed up late fixing the big red tractor. Finally, after many nights, Farmer Dave was done. He jumped onto the big red tractor and turned him on. Put, put, kaboom. <laughs> you, you like that, right? <laughs> he jumped in the driver's seat and had so much fun that he plowed the whole field that very night. The next morning, the villagers woke up to a huge surprise. Their work was done for them. They would not have to spend many weeks pushing and pulling the big red tractor over the fields of dirt. It's a miracle. Who did this for us? Look over there. It was Farmer Dave sleeping on the big red tractor. The people shouted happily. Farmer Dave was right. The tractor book is true. That year, the villagers plowed and harvested many fields. They had so much extra food that they were able to share it with people in other villages who needed it. When they visited other villages, village, villages Farmer Dave and the Big Red Tractor always took the book with them so that they could teach others the wonderful news they learned. The little village kept sharing, and villagers became known as the most generous people in the world. Did you know that you are like that big red tractor? God made you, and He knows just how you work best. And He wrote a book full of truth. That you can read to help you know how to live too. The Bible tells us that if we try to do things on our own, we won't accomplish very much. But if we trust Jesus, God gives us His Spirit so that we'll have new power. Everybody say, new power. That we will have the power to love others and the power to tell other people about God. God made us to be a blessing to others. Listen, through the Holy Spirit, we can do great things. Just like Jesus. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
you will receive power. My friends, I just want to encourage you today. Don't do things on your own. Boy, it's much better to do it God's way. And it's much better to do it in His power and not yours. It will be much more effective. You will have much more fruit and vegetables to eat yourself and share with those all around you when you're reliant upon the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and in our church. So you may ask yourself, well, what do I need to do? Okay, pastor, I hear the word of God. I hear what you're saying to me, but what practical steps do I need to take? Number one thing I would tell you this. If you want the power of the Holy Spirit operating in your life, number one, remove all the barriers. Remove all the barriers. What, what's the barriers? Sin. Sin. Remove the sin. The Bible says, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ in, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number two is this, request the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you have to beg and plead? Do you have to fast forever? Boy, I hope not. By the way, I heard somebody talking about prayer and fasting, and they said, I don't, I don't want to brag or anything, but I finished my 21-day fast in 24 hours. Okay. <clears throat> like, okay. Get back on, get back on the train. <laughs> but request the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> It says in Luke chapter 11, I didn't put this in your notes, but it says, if you, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? He wants to give you His power. He delights in it. Number three is this, receive Him by faith. Receive Him by faith. How did you receive salvation? By faith. How do you receive healing? By faith. How do you receive anything from God? By faith. How do you receive the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit upon your life? You receive Him by faith. It says in Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And number four is this, relate to the Holy Spirit every day. Just like any good preacher, I, put, I started all those with R's, okay? So you could re remember them better, all right? Relate to the Holy Spirit Every day. I love what it says. The amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ and the extravagant love of God the Father, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul prayed, be with you all. The intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. Develop a friendship, a closeness, a nearness with the Holy Spirit. And my friends, you will never have to do this Christian life on your own. And we will never be dependent upon our own human strength in this church. What we want to do is be fully dependent upon the person and work of the Holy Spirit as we move into 2020 and beyond. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? We're just going to enter into a time of prayer together this morning, and I want to pray over each of us that our hearts would be open to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and maybe we're here today and we've never thought about the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never even heard there was a Holy Spirit. 
Maybe you never knew that he was a person. Maybe you never knew that he wanted to help you and empower you in your life. And you're just like, wow, the third person of the Trinity wants to dwell inside of me. He wants to change me. He wants to make me a brand new creation, and he wants to empower me to accomplish God's will for me. If you're here today and you would say, yeah, I I want and I need the power of the Holy Spirit operating in my life. I just want you to raise your hand up to God and just say, that's me. I'm open. I want to know His power. I I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit in a fresh new way. Boy, I don't want to live this Christian life like like rowing an oar, but I want to put my sail up and let the wind of the Holy Spirit energize everything that I do. And Father, you see us this this afternoon, and Father, you see our hands raised, and Lord, we pray, Lord, for just a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon our church. I pray for every brother, every sister who calls upon the name of the Lord, who names the name of Christ, Lord. Lord, that you fill them afresh right now with your spirit, God. Lord, we ask you to fill us up right now. Fill us afresh, Lord. Fill us with your power, God. We want to be anointed by your Holy Spirit to fulfill your plan and your purpose for our lives, God. church let's just begin to pray Lord we exalt your name we love you Lord we need your power God we need your anointing we need your spirit in our lives God we don't want to do it our own ways Lord Lord we love you and praise you we sing hallelujah to the king of kings and the Lord of lords and I pray father that you would just move in a powerful way Lord fresh wind fresh fire upon our lives, God. Lord, that we would burn for you, God. Lord, that our passion for you would burn. Lord, that our passion for reaching the lost would burn. Lord God, wake us up if we're asleep. Lord, bring us out of our comfort zones if we're just sitting in our rocking chairs, God. But wake us up, open our eyes, open our hearts to your power and to the person and work of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen.